Did you know that SpaceX wants to put a refueling base station on the moon? Should this take place, the lunar refueling base will become the first off-world, beyond low Earth orbit, space-based infrastructure. A fledgling start for a newly spacefaring world. This video and others were brought to you in part by our awesome patrons. Thank you. No matter how advanced, how good our technology is or may become, it is still not without wear and tear, needing repair, which means that the lunar refueling base will need to be staffed, which also means for the first time in our history, Human beings will be living and working off-world beyond low Earth orbit. This is only the beginning. In time, other stations will indeed follow. This time, we're going into space to stay. It was only a matter of time. But why this time and not last time, 50 years ago? In a word, need. I'll explain. As a species, we're explorers, constantly seeking new adventures, new challenges, the highest mountain peaks. The Earth, as wonderful and amazing as it is, is beginning to no longer represent such adventures, such challenges. Psychologically, we've climbed nearly every summit. We have begun to outgrow the earth, our proverbial nest. Therefore, it is time to spread our wings, ignite our thrusters, and take to the heavens as never before. To boldly go where humans have yet to go. Space is our new frontier. This is the first of a series of videos about space infrastructure. It's an important subject, vital in fact. It's one that requires much thought. The topic is immense. The amount of knowledge required to construct one is, well, vast. In this series, we will be posing many important questions. Why do we need such infrastructure? Can we build one now at our tech level? And if so, how are we going to build one? Where should we build it? And so on. Conceivably, the most basic form of space station is the outpost. Outposts serve a vast variety of functions, from research stations, such as the International Space Station, to maintenance stations, etc. Outposts are not necessarily staffed. Any satellite of sufficient size might be counted as an automated outpost. Perhaps one of the most important 
kinds of space infrastructure is the depot. This includes propellant depots such as what SpaceX is planning on building to asteroid mining depots or any station that collects or stores resources is a depot. Depots are the key to routine spaceflight. I'll explain. Collecting and storing resources in space is the beginning of an interplanetary economy. If there's money to be made, then folks will follow, and with this, spaceflight will become routine. SpaceX is doing a fantastic job in getting us into space. They're paving the way, showing what can be done, and inspiring others in the process. It is clear, space is indeed our next exploration and even profitable new frontier. With what SpaceX and others are doing with the implementation of certain technologies, the cost of getting into space will assuredly fall, which means that daily flights to and from space draws ever closer still. But getting into space is only half the equation. Once we are in space, the need for supportive infrastructure becomes evident. With an ever-increasing drive for mining in space, and with the great potential for scientific research, and a growing desire for many to live in space, the necessity of space infrastructure is slowly being realized. This is where SpaceX's planned Lunar Fuel Depot comes into play. The Lunar Fuel Depot solves many challenges associated with just getting off world, opening the doorway into space, and making space travel more feasible. In time, space travel will indeed become routine, commonplace occurrence. The SpaceX Starship lacks the capability of flying to Mars and returning without refueling first. Therefore, a refueling station on Mars is practically the first thing to be set up. A refueling depot on one or both of the Martian moons, Phobos or Deimos, would be even better. The tiny low gravity of the moons makes it extremely easy to leave. A depot on at least one of the moons would allow much more cargo and passengers to travel between Earth and Mars. Just these efforts alone will produce at least two off-world colonies and probably, or more likely, more. Outposts and depots alone won't get us the living, thriving, diverse space culture that we dream of, the kind of future science fiction frequently illustrates. What we need are habitats, not simple outposts like the ISS, but large, mostly self-sufficient, comfortable space colonies that supply everything folks need to live indefinitely in space. This means air, radiation protection, artificial gravity, water, food, and a pleasant, airy living space. The kinds of things we all require here on Earth. There's a bewildering zoo of habitat designs. We can hardly cover them all here. There's much more to discuss, so we'll give a broad overview of the subject and dive into the details in future episodes. As space travel becomes more commonplace, as we build new stations, and as more and more individuals venture into space for a whole host of reasons, the need for all manner of jobs, talents, hobbies will increase exponentially. In space and on other planets, there will be a need for every possible profession. 
engineers, scientists, doctors, mechanics, musicians, painters, artists, cooks, servers, sales staff, accountants, pilots, drivers, messieurs, etc. All sorts of professions and hobbies. You and others in the not too distant future will have an opportunity to live and work in space, not merely in Earth orbit, but further afield. Additionally, mining and exploration is not only going to take place between Earth and Mars, but also within and beyond our system. We could, in fact, potentially or perhaps most likely, end up with a Star Wars-like scenario. Rather than dozens of incredibly diverse planets, all somehow breathable and habitable, we will instead have stations located all throughout the system, where anyone with a self-propelled tin can could easily hop between stations, especially since we're only dealing with microgravity. You could visit a giant station orbiting near Venus with a desert climate, or another orbiting mere few hundred kilometers away with a tropical climate. Other stations, both on and off planets, could have any possible climate, and in the microgravity of space, many different gravity levels. Instead of globe trotting, one could set out and go system trekking. Star Trek, anyone? Again, just to drive the point home, this only further demonstrates the need for every kind of profession, hobby, or talent that exists. There is one thing we have not yet covered. The number of folks who want to get off Earth to live in space has been steadily increasing. With Earth's population rapidly approaching 8 or 9 billion and growing exponentially, we could be approaching upwards of 30 billion by as soon as 2050. So there's definitely more than enough folks to colonize not just one but many space stations, which will in turn create thousands if not tens of thousands of jobs. And this number will only increase as we continue expanding into space and eventually, yes, into other systems as well. We might also want to consider planetary colonies. These may not be space stations per se, but they are a form of space infrastructure and are just as important, if not more so, as any space habitat. What might make space infrastructure necessary? I think we can say that no station will ever be built without a need, especially when you consider the cost, not to mention the time it will take to construct just one. But there's another factor. If we want to do anything in space, obviously we're going to need some form of protection. And if we're going to be out there for any length of time, more than a few hours, that protection must also be able to sustain life. And if we're going to be out there for more than 24 hours, we need it to hold air, water, and food. What I've described is the most basic form of a space station. But looking ahead, what reasons might compel us to build many large stations? There are many beneficial reasons for why we need to venture into space. As I've already stated, we're explorers. We have the itch to seek new adventures, to explore new lands. Paraphrasing the late Carl Sagan, 
or even your species may be owed by a restless few, drawn by a craving they can hardly articulate or understand, to undiscovered lands and new worlds. As individuals and nations alike, the need for a driving purpose is paramount. Space mandates such purpose. But equally as important is another reason, life and limb. It's been discussed many a times. Nevertheless, the point is valid and more evident today than it was 30 years ago, due in large part to the fact that we're now more aware of what lies and waits for us in space. In effect, we are living in a cosmic shooting gallery where the universe has, on many occasions, aimed its asteroids and comets directly at us. When you consider the following words by Carl Sagan from his Pale Blue Dot speech, it becomes clear. Look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. Metaphorically speaking, all of our eggs are in one basket amidst a shooting gallery. There's no egg carton to cushion an impact. Imagine a primitive tribe. They have spent a millennia living on top of a slumbering volcano. Slumbering, yet very much alive. Over the time they refine their understanding of the world around them. Challenges are presented and solutions are found. Methodical trial and error is eventually applied. Answers are found to questions their ancestors never dreamed of. Yet the volcano remains beneath them, slumbering, building to an eruption. In time, scholarly tribesmen and tribeswomen through experimentation, discover their mountain home, long known to be a volcano, but also long thought to be completely inactive, a dead volcano, is in fact very much alive and building to a future eruption. The concerned scholars exhort their fellow tribesfolks to take action, either to move away, somewhere safe, or to find means of calming the volcano, of releasing the building pressure safely. But the vast majority of tribesfolks laugh off the notion. They've lived on their mountain for a millennia. Unaware of the danger, why should their newfound knowledge of a potential danger suddenly cause the volcano to become immediately dangerous? Well, we're in that situation with our planet so to speak. For a millennia, hundreds of millennia, we've lived in ignorance of the potential danger that surrounds us, surrounds our fragile home. Obviously to the fact that we are a bullseye in a cosmic shooting gallery. So, we say, why should it be suddenly important to take action? We have survived all this time Surely such an event must be incredibly unlikely. That is, until eventually the unlikely occurs. Gamma ray bursts do happen and asteroids do impact. So is there a need? A need to colonize space? You tell me. Should we do nothing, make no effort to defend our planet against potential dangers, make no move into space? Or should we take heed of our relatively newfound knowledge and make the effort to preserve our species, our culture? The timing may turn out to be, strangely enough, 
spot on. You see, more often than not, the timing of events tends to coincide, especially now when we are about to become prepared. If we're going to build true interstellar starships, they can only be constructed and launched from space, in space, whilst in orbit within one of these stations. This is but one of many reasons for our research into mega space structures. And if we want to learn more about space, there's no substitute for being in space, out there. Do we have the tech, the know-how, to construct a large space station, colony stations, today? The answer may seem like a resounding yes, given the ISS, the International Space Station. But such a station is not enough. It will not do. It's too fragile. There's no artificial gravity. And frankly, we need to shield ourselves better. Besides, our technology has since advanced. With new materials, new manufacturing techniques, such as the advent of 3D printing, it has set the stage for something better, something more habitable, something for our expansion into space. The time is now. Well, thank you for watching. I hope every one of you have enjoyed this video. You know, our plans are great and many, but we have only basically just begun publicly. If you want to contact us, do so through YouTube or our website, astronex.com. We want to give a big thanks and shout out to all our patrons, but especially Walter Matera and Shelby Zimmer for being super light and translight interstellar level patrons. Thank you for your support. You know what I'm going to say. Until next time, keep wandering about space. Thank you.